all, thank you, uh, Oneness Mullaney in beautiful Southeast Queensland, Australia. Thank you for having me here and uh, for having the opportunity. I greatly enjoy being able to present some of these things uh, that we're going to cover tonight. And um, uh, Nancy Drewart, she's written this book called The Resonate, and it's sort of a larger format book about doing slide presentations. And uh, she says one thing you need to kind of get used to doing is, is murdering your darlings. And your darlings are your slides. Because <laughs> uh, on this particular, I have about 175 slides, but I can't, obviously can't use all of those. So I had to, I mean, a lot of them have just been pushed down. I will not see those. But the point is, it's a creative, it's a creative effort, and uh, you do get attached sometimes when you create. So um, there are uh, six sections to this, and depending upon our time constraints, because we have till uh, five? 5.30. 5.30. Um, and is there a break in the middle? No, normally. Because we're just gonna power, power through. Yeah, just keep going. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, if we don't get to every single section of this, Sorry, it's 4.30 now. 4.30. Yeah, that's all right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so um, into Luminous Futures. Uh, we are, of course, right now challenged in so many ways. Uh, in the exterior world, uh, things that are going on, and uh, for many people it's like just gigantic uh, question of what's going to happen, what are we going to do, uh, civil liberties and everything. So, becoming visionaries and midwives uh, for the birthing of the new earth. And so, I'm just going to start moving through. A little bit of background about myself. Uh, Ericksonian psychotherapy, body-centered psychotherapy. Uh, these are connected. Clinical hypnotherapy. So, uh, all of these have sort of merged. And th those of you who are therapists, you know that you, know, you, you pick things up along the way and then they get integrated and incorporated into what you do. Um, certified trainer in heart math. Uh, who has heard of heart math? This hand? Yeah, of course you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I have never heard of that. Uh, training in heart rhythm meditation with the Institute of Applied Meditation. That's also over, over in the States. That's a Sufi based heart rhythm uh, practice, which I greatly I just put all these things together. And heart focused uh, living since really the early. 1970s, uh, 73, Big Island of Hawaii, and I began, started meditating on what's called the Paramatma, or the supreme self that resides in the heart. So that's a yogi thing. That's a uh, Sanskrit. Yeah, so uh, one of my heroes, and uh, I, I read this in his beautiful, soulful book. This is uh, Masunobu Fukuoka, who wrote One Straw Revolution. Has anyone? <coughs> yeah. Right. That's a very soulful book, those of you who've read it know. He's passed away subsequently, but um, he had a big, like a Satori experience. Uh, he had a big night drinking and he fell asleep leaning against the tree along a river. He woke up, woke up in the morning, came to consciousness, and he heard a heron uh, sort of flapping wings taking off through the mist. And uh, suddenly, boom. Satori, or whatever you would call it, he had a type of awakening, which uh, really discounted all material knowledge, because he was a chemist, uh, had university degrees. So he said, despite the change, I remained at root an average foolish man, and there has been no change in this from uh, then to the present time. And this, this I identify with this, because I, I had an experience three days after I graduated high school, had this big kaboom thing, and my life was going, <clears throat> and it just went off in a totally different direction. And I just knew. And at that time, it was very apparent that um, the future, the future was a very big consideration. I'm not even sure, I wasn't sure. I had no way of contextualizing it or framing it up when it happened. But it was like, I know, I remember telling my sister, Kathy, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to be involved in this life in a spiritual revolution. Right? Going from, you know, I was a captain of the track team, I was a wrestling team, and, and surfing, and just, you know, smoking weed with the boys, and all that stuff. And just, it just went in a completely different direction. So, I identify with this statement. Uh, I don't see myself as anything special. 
uh, and I remain, uh, in my years of doing psychotherapy, understanding, to understand the human condition. And so we're all in it, we're all dealing with it, and it's amazing. As uh, Carlos Castaneda said, it's uh, to dealing with the terror and the wonder of the whole thing. It's just remarkable. So I've got it in six parts, and depending on our time, if we run out of time, every part is sort of self-sustaining, and every part has value. So uh, we'll just see how it goes. I'm not going to get hung up like, I'm not finishing. I'm not going to try to jam it all through. Uh, yes. Meditation. So this is a brief three-minute meditation. It's eyes open. It's uh, Jean-Pierre Clairvoy, French astronaut, right? And he's talking about his experiences of seeing Earth from space. It is the beautiful uh, French accent, uh, but it's, it's not, uh, it, it, is, it is intelligible. So I think, well, I'm going to get speakers here. I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> When you see Earth from space for the first time, you literally fall in love with your home planet. The emotion is intense in front of the combination of beauty, fragility of life, and power of the geological and meteorological elements. The field of view extends to thousands of kilometers around, and as we fly fast at 28,000 kilometers per hour, the landscape below varies very quickly, showing a striking diversity. You are seized by the dramatic contrast between this big, bright, colorful ball illuminated by the sun and the deep black background of the cosmos. Indeed, astronauts can't discern these stars in the sky when the sun or the earth shines through those spaceship windows. You feel the need to protect Earth because the atmosphere appears so thin on the horizon that you realize how much all life on Earth depends on this so tiny layer of gas maintained by such a fragile balance with the oceans. But after a few orbits, you see volcanoes, big mountains, hurricanes, huge tidal waves, glaciers, gigantic icebergs, and you realize that Earth lives its own life regardless of human activities. You become respectful. Earth is a very strong and powerful tectonic and climatic object which may seem a paradox since, at the same time, it shows fragility of life. If you tend first to look at details of places where you've been living, you quickly enjoy watching our planet as a whole. It is isolated, meaning nothing else around exists which can come and help us. It is unique since no other planet resembles Earth by far. It is finite because from space you see its limited dimensions. And again, you are so impressed by the living beauty of the whole show that you feel happy and can't prevent emotional tears forming in your eyes. As you understand the rarity of this view lived by only few of us, you decide your duty is to share the experience and to make understand that all humans are members of the same crew of this single natural spaceship traveling alone in this freezing, black, infinite emptiness of the universe. Indeed, we should manage Earth as a spaceship, understanding how it works and living in harmony with its resources, like we do with our own spaceship, in order to never be in lack. Earth, one home, one crew, one mission. Let all future generations live long and prosper. Those are real images uh, taken from the L1 Lagrange point, 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth, sun to the back. So, so you, you don't see any stars, but uh, the stars are there. In fact, it, the astronauts say there are so many stars, it's almost like there's more luminous uh, than there are black spaces between the stars. There's so many. Part 1.1. One, point one, entitled, you may say I'm a dreamer, and uh, some of this will be pretty dreamy as we kind of get rolling, uh, but I encourage dreaming, I encourage 
the imagination. And I'm not the only one, and I imagine many of us here, if not most, if possibly all of us are dreamers in this group. Uh, not for ourselves were we born, but for the world. I would, I would say, uh, it's, this is my conjecture, uh, that yes, we're here and we have, uh, some of you midwives know this very well, we, have, we bring in issues and we bring in challenges, things we're gonna learn in this life about, but uh, this is a pretty special time to be here. And my belief is that we are here also for the world. And uh, I love this statement by John the Baptist out of the Bible. I'm but a voice in the wilderness and clearing the way for the one who is to come. And my conjecture here is that we are all the voice in the wilderness and we are all the one to come. And um, it sort of stands as a beautiful little um, archetypal structure of... Uh, what we can be involved in doing here. The Hopi elders, they were attuned to this very same thing. We're the ones we've been waiting for. It, it's, it's up to us. And Thomas Berry, cultural historian, he's most well known for his statement, the reason we're in trouble is because we don't have a story, a proper story anymore. We're sort of in between stories. But this quote, the great work is what he calls it, is a role given to us beyond any consultation with ourselves we did not choose. Well, those of us who have done really deep work, uh, as in like uh, some of the hypnotic work I've done, and I'm sure some of others, um, there is an orchestration that occurs at deep levels of, in the psyche where I, I know I'm, I want to go in. I want to go into that, and I want to uh, go through that, and I want to embrace the challenges. I want to grow through the challenges to become more, evolve more, become more aware, loving. We were chosen by some power beyond ourselves for this historical task, beyond our surface safety persona selves. Uh, and there's never been a better time to be here. I truly believe that. I, this is what I want to be right here. We're right in the middle of it. Uh, and Thomas Berry also had a word that he coined, which was incendence. Transcendence, incendence, to incend. So a lot, that means like to really embody, to come and to be here on earth, to be here. I'm here, Ram Dass, be here now. I'm here, I'm here for, here for some really special category of learning. Diana Nyad went to my high school, I knew her. First human being, man or woman, does, first human being to swim from Cuba to Key West, Florida. People have been trying to do it since 1950. And what I find uh, very interesting, she was two grades ahead of me, is a couple things. Find a way, all right? That's what we, we're all kind of orienting. Find a way, we find a way into a luminous future with everything that's going on. Where the, and I pull that off. Everything you've been going through has been preparing you for what you've come to do, to be, to unfold, to evolve, to awaken. Everything you've been going through. And although uh, we might say, oh, well, she did that swim, it was her fifth attempt. And who remembers the Beatles' uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club album? Yes. <laughs> that was revolutionary when that came out. Yeah. And uh, there's the song, very Paul McCartney with the clarinets and, you know, kind of old-fashioned. When I'm 64, right? <laughs> and when I was listening to it, I was about 15 or whatever it was, and it was like, 64? Man, that's ancient! <laughs> she did it when she was 64. All everyone said... Impossible. She had had four attempts prior. You can't, it can't her phys, the physiologist, the doctors, the neurologist, the every everyone, including her head handler, uh, said can't be done. It cannot be done. Uh, it's just impossible. And but her head handler, who they were very intimate, close friends, said, but if you're gonna do it, I'll be there with you all the way through. And she did it. And whoo. She's one of my heroes, definitely. She's just amazing. And a little side note, because I have her book. I found her book like on a, on a free table. It's just, my gosh, this is, they're just giving this away. It's a hardbound, beautiful. 
called Find a Way, Diana and I, a TED Talk. If you remember her name, watch her TED Talk. It's rem remarkable, it's amazing. She was, and I knew this guy, didn't like him, and never liked him, uh, the swimming coach at my high school. He uh, ag aggressively, um, I don't know what they call it, uh, but uh, uh, abused her, um, what's that thing? Groomed her, that's the word, groomed her, and just- Pushed her, did he? Push her in swimming? No, no, sexually. Oh. Yeah. And it was, uh, it, there we are in the boys' locker room, you know, showering and going and getting ready to do. And this stuff was going on in the next, right in the next part of the building over there with her and him. And uh, so, people, I was sexually abused. I can't do anything, right? She was sexually abused and she did something amazing, right? She's an extraordinary person. But anyway, uh, it's amazing. Uh, everything you've been going through has been preparing you for what you came yeah. for. So also, not just that I swam from Cuba to Key West, first time, first human being ever, but I did it with this immense wounding that occurred when I was like 13 years old and 14 years old and right on up for three or four years. Never liked that guy. He didn't like me either. I don't like you. <laughs> you don't like me. Yes. Now, many of you have heard of Joseph Campbell, probably. Who's heard of Joseph Campbell? Give me those hands, yes. One of the great uh, world uh, scholars in uh, mythology, academic, and he wrote a number of books. The first one that I ever got was called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, uh, yeah. and uh, 1949 publication. <clears throat> I choose to believe that many of us are at some stage within our personal hero's journey, or heroine's journey. I believe that, right? Probably everyone here. But maybe someone might not, no, I'm not in your age. I just heard, read about this, I just heard about this, and I'm coming here to hear what this guy's gonna say. Campbell also said, we'll get into those three, but he said there's, there's village life. If you're not in this, if you're not in the hero's journey, village life, the wasteland, and hero's journey, or heroine's journey. Three stages or three three aspects of a separation, initiation, and return. And uh, in the separation, which is where most people sort of realize they're kind of on a journey of some sort. Um, there's the call. Joseph Campbell consulted with George Lucas on the Star Wars movies. Seventy nine was the first one. It was very mythic, right? This is mythic, right? And. Uh, there was that call, young Luke Skywalker, the call was there. Separation, it's a difficult time. Uh, in, in, initiation, intensity, and dangers intrinsic to initiation. I've seen pictures of Aboriginal initiation rites, uh, and there was about, you know, sort of a long oval, men lying feet to the center, heads, and then there was uh, towards the heads of about, about say 20 men, Towards the, there was these sticks with a white, something white tied to the sticks. They were dead. These initiation rites were very difficult, very strenuous, and you might die. In mythology, it's the journey to the underworld. Jason and the Argonauts gonna uh, retrieve the golden fleece. What is it for us, right? Uh, it's unique to each of us. And then the life enhancing return. All of these are going on right now. Pretty much in, in many ways, we're, we're in all three of them in many ways. Joseph Campbell, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Carl Jung, this is a very relevant quote by Carl Jung right now. Enlightenment is not attained by imagining beings of light, but rather by making the darkness conscious. And that is what is happening right now. The darkness is becoming conscious. All right, that is exactly what's happening right now. More about that later. 1990, when I moved to Canberra from the Hawaii, I had the good fortune to hear uh, Jean Houston speak. She's one of the founders of the transpersonal psychology movement. Brilliant woman, about this tall. <laughs> she's a big woman. And she's so, she's just a genius. And uh, these are the times we are the people. And uh, it's so impressive. She's written a number of very, just amazing books and uh, these are so back then in her powerful presentation 
these are the times and we are the people. This is 1990. Well, these are really the times and these are really the people. This, this is like, there's never been times like this, ever. This is, this is monumental. Individuals can and do change the world, right? So, Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, suffragette. Harriet Tubman, America, in America, when I was a boy, they had American Heritage, I think, and they had this history programs, and I heard about her, and I was just like, started crying. Whew, slave liberator, she would, had an underground railroad, is what she called it, and she was getting slaves out of the south and up into the north. It was just like, radically. And Frank, uh, young diarist, uh, Jewish girl in Amsterdam, stuck in an attic for two years until they got discovered, and then she died in one of the concentration camps. Just this most insightful and perceptive and impressionable and innocent, beautiful, beautiful being. And the irony also, because I've had a fascination with Nazi, the Nazi phenomenon, because the whole idea of darkness and evil, this is like, what, what is with us human folk, right? We can, we can sink to such horrific evil ways of being, and yet incredibly loving. We can just be so loving also. Anyway, challenge of evil. My mother and father are named Anne and Frank. <laughs> and uh, yes, and then Rosa Parks, uh, she is the young black woman who sat on that bus and just edge of the wedge, edge of the wedge. I get chills thinking about these people. A few, a few of the guys, right? Uh, all these people I'm talking about, they're all, I'm, they're, I just look up to them. Uh, Henry David Thoreau. So some people are, you gotta be activist. You gotta get that out there and march and you know, all that. But not everyone does that. Not, that's not what everyone has to do. And some people, so he wrote, does that work? No, on the screen. Civil Disobedience and his bigger, more famous work is Walden. Uh, when he was in, in his 20s, he built a little cabin in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts on the property of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he said, I wanted to learn to live authentically. Right? And it's a brilliant book. It's just like uh, Masanobu Fukuoka's uh, One Straw Revolution. It's very soulful. It's a very soulful book. Pen and ink. And for two years, two months, and two days, that's what he did as a young man. You know, he, so he built the cabin. That's a facsimile recreation of the cabin, but it looks just like what he built. And so, you know, we have this thing now called the Keyboard Warriors. Have you heard of that? Yeah, Keyboard Warriors, right? I just drop, I drop this warrior metaphor business. I'm over the warrior thing. Peaceful warrior, this warrior and that warrior. It's like, okay, we've done the warrior thing. Let's do the magician thing. Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi both were highly influenced by civil disobedience and the whole slant by Henry David Thoreau. So he was in the 1850s. He wrote that, uh, published uh, Walden in 1854. And uh, yeah, so how one contributes is, there is no proper way, it's just your way, your own individual way. Carl Jung, another one of my heroes. I'm gonna read this, I'm not supposed to read. Don't read, <laughs> don't have a read along when you do. I, I'm reading along, The great because this is so relevant. The great events of world history are, at bottom, profoundly unimportant. In the last analysis, the essential thing is the life of the individual. This alone makes history. Here alone do the great transformations take place. And the whole future ultimately springs as a gigantic summation from these hidden sources in individuals. In our most private and most subjective lives, we are not only the passive witnesses of our age and its sufferers, but also its makers. Because you matter. We all matter. We matter. We're like, you know they have these, uh, I've, never, I've never seen one. <laughs> I don't want to see one. The suitcase nuclear weapons. It's a nuclear bomb in a suitcase. There was apparently the US, they made, two of them disappeared some years ago. But, so it's a suitcase and Who's not loved a suitcase around? But 
that is a different kind of suitcase. And that is a suitcase of immense power. We are all like that. We, just a suitcase. I'm just a suitcase, right? But what, we, what we're capable of, right? You know, there was a woman in Alabama who lifted a car off her son when he got trapped under his car, et cetera, et cetera. These stories abound, right? People, you can't do that. Right? We all matter. We all matter. And we mostly, often, I don't know about you guys, but mostly, most people live with that. They haven't tapped into their mattering and just how they matter and how powerful they are. I choose to believe. I choose to believe that each one of us is called to take part in the birthing of a new earth. Right? That's what I believe. I believe we are all called separation, initiation, and return. We are in the separation and we're hearing the call. The birthing of a new earth. Two parts to this that I'm talking about. The birthing of a new earth through evolving our vision of the future. Quote from the Bible, the people without vision perish. We gotta have a vision, right? Not just against oh, they're the bad guys, they're the technocrats, they're the elite or whatever, whoever, WHO, who we gotta have a vision that does more than just be against. The birthing of a new earth through direct affirmative responsive actions aligned with our visions. They have to be aligned with our visions, and the visions get to that. Where responsibility is not a burden but a freedom, greatest responsibility. A greatest freedom is responsibility. Greatest freedom is responsibility. It has nothing to do with blame or punishment or forcing or guilt, like many of our parents <laughs> and teachers try to. Responsibility, your ability, your capacity to respond, that's what it is. That's the way to think about responsibility. <coughs> Anyone ever read this book? Mm. It takes about 30 minutes. You, have you read it? Yeah. yeah. Long, yeah, same. Long, I read it like 35 years ago. And, but it's beautiful. And it's the translation. Um, I did speak some French. My first wife was French. And uh, Jean Guillaume. And it's just a beautiful, you, it's available. You can kind of just type it in. And there's a PDF of it on the internet. It's a beautiful book. And it's very inspiring. I had a friend. He was a, a psychologist, educated at Harvard. And ta he taught at another university. And I said, hey, David, uh, have you read uh, Man Who Planted Trees? I just finished it. It's like super inspired. He goes, oh, yeah, I read it a few years ago. Uh, and then I found out it was fictional. And he kind of like, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, I don't care if it was a fictional, David. I, you know, it was just so beautiful. And it, the idea, and it was written so believably, not to deceive the reader, or the reader, but just, right. Then I heard about this guy. And this is the real deal. Has anyone heard of uh, Jada Penyang? Some, some have, yes. Forest Man. You can Google that on YouTube. Or you can search it and you can see that. It's an award-winning documentary on him. When he was 16, he just started planting trees and, uh, on a giant island out in the middle of the Brahmaputra River, I think, in eastern India. And by the time he was, I don't know, 45 or 50, it was a, an entire ecosystem established with large animals, including large predators like tigers. I mean, that's like, well, you gotta have a really happening thing to have a big predator like a tiger happening in this. Uh, incredible, incredible what he did by himself. And he, he had to, anyway, look, look that up. Watch that, watch that documentary. Then I heard about this guy. Nine-year-old Felix Finkbeiner had a vision, little German boy. Right? Little, little German boy. And out of that vision, he manifested a choice and a decision. <laughs> I'm going to plant a million trees. Right? <laughs> I didn't do that very well, but I'm going to plant a million trees. That was his decision out of his choice. Three years later, out of that. So, first of all, let's slow this down a little bit. Think of it. A little nine-year-old. A little nine-year-old ch child, boy. And he had a quiet moment, just like Carl Jung was talking about. And a quiet moment popped in. Where is it? Actually, it pops in here. It pops in from the back of the heart. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll get to that. And then, I'm going to do that. Right? <laughs> I'm going to do it. By the time he's 19 years old, out of that little moment, 14 
billion trees had been planted that grew out of that little moment of that little nine-year-old boy Current vision of the trillion trees, I've really studied, I've really, I have to say, envisioned, and I've talked a lot about what a trillion is. It's a thousand billion. And, uh, man, good luck with that. The whole future ultimately springs with a gigantic summation from these hidden sources and individuals. Oh, boy. Greta Thunberg, my wife's Norwegian. Greta's, she's Swedish. She's, I believe she's been hijacked by others. I'm just going to kind of stay away from that side, though. Um, but I believe her initial impetus was pure and wonderful and amazing. Person of the Year, Time Magazine, 2019. There are, from a variety of sources, indications and intimations of an, an immense, irresistible, and dynamic presence of love poised at the fringe of our reality in the future. Not very far in the future. In the future. Einstein said, time and space are modes by which we think, not conditions in which we live. We kind of, time and space are kind of like in our ways of thinking. Modes by which we think, not conditions in which we live. But there's something just off in the fringe. <coughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm going to pay attention to that. <laughs> a love holding an invisible, attractive, vibratory, pulling power. An immense resonance. An immense resonance. Buckminster Fuller, love is metaphysical gravity. I love that. Love is metaphysical gravity. And... We know, like, of terms of gravity in the cosmic situation, circumstance, there is a black hole, and that, that gravity is so powerful in that it sucks, light can't even get out and get away from it. The, everything gets gobbled. There's just something m monumental. Various different sorts of metaphysical resources talk about it, but, um, yeah. You could just search that out a little bit. Resonance. The means through which vibrational energy can get transferred from one physical entity to another with great efficiency. So that's Ravi Shankar. When I was in a freshman in the University of Florida, I went and saw a concert to Ravi Shankar, who stood a la record playing the tablas, you know. And then there was almost always you can watch this on any YouTube video where they're doing Indian music, there's always the tambura player sitting in the background. And they look like they're on drugs. <laughs> And the fingers are dun, 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 dun. It's the vibrational. It's the Indian equivalent of the didgeridoo. And uh, but the sitar, this has this one has seven main strings. And then look at all those little strings underneath there. Those are the resonating strings, and they are all tuned just so that when every time a note is hit, some of those are vibrating simultaneously. It's a whole resonant reality. Incredible. And uh, he's at the Monterey Pop Festival back in the days where jamming on a guitar, you know, like, oh, that guy can, before they even knew what shredding was, but that guy <laughs> can really, yeah. So he just like, no one could believe him. You are expressing a resonance right now, every one of us. We all are kind of, we're, we're vibratory. We're vibratory beings. We're putting out a resonance. And if someone comes into the room who is overflowing with love, and you, like, who just walked into the room? or they're steeply depressed. Oh, what's going on? What? Who is that? You know, we feel it. We're feeling beings. Our hearts pick up on it right away. We may not be conscious of it yet. So, four points. Your future visions hold a resonance. Your future visions. What's your future vision? What's your future vision, right? Change your future vision and your resonance changes. What's going to happen? I don't know, man. I think we're all doomed. I think the end of human civilization, right? Well, if you carry that vision around, your resonance is not going to be very on a very sublime frequency. When your resonance changes, your being changes. Your resonance affects self, others, and the world. Transmute fear into love. <laughs> 
fear and the love. So, number four, this one. Your resonance affects self other than the world. Hmm. Twin Towers, 9-11. I walked out, I woke up in the, the morning, not that late either, it's about 5.30, and walked down the stairs. One of my sons goes, Dad, yeah, you know the Twin Towers? Yeah, uh, I, was, I was in New York for a while when they were being built in 1970. Well, they don't exist anymore. <laughs> so I was in this kimono walking down the stairs. Your resonance affects self, others, and the world. So these are from two geosynchronous uh, uh, satellites uh, measuring the Earth's geomagnetic field. Got it in the measurement. Right? Out of the, the human, human, collective human resonance. Right? It shows up. We are, we are doing stuff. We are, if, uh, have an effect. When your resonance changes, your being changes. And, of course, the famous quote by Gandhi, be the change you wish to see in the world. You be it. You be it. That's the divine feminine principle. Hallelujah. Thank God that's coming back. <laughs> divine feminine principle. Being, receiving, feeling, as differing from doing and thinking and acquiring. They both, they both need to be in balance, but it's getting way out of balance. <clears throat> A brief exercise to instantly change your resonance. This is what a little exercise for us that we're going to do. Nothing. So, could you remember a time when, okay, and in five or ten words, just silently within yourself, describe a warm, renewing, expanding emotional experience you've had, okay? And, for example, when, when I saw the sunrise over the ocean that morning, or when I got a puppy for my 10th birthday, or met my life partner, that was such a special time, or graduated from university, or saw a starry night on a dark, moonless night, just a giant, giant open field, and I looked up, and, right? So, and these are the kinds of uh, um, renewing and expanding emotional states that go along with this. So, if you would, uh, allow yourself just to gently close your eyes, now, this, this is going to be very brief, but just within yourself, in just a few words, five or ten words, whatever. Could you go ahead and remember a time that was a special time where you contacted one of these kinds of emotional states? Joy, love, compassion, happiness, awe, gratitude, wonder, caring, forgiveness, delight, empathy. Access a memory, a beautiful memory, where you touch upon one of these expanding emotional states. And when you got one, just feel into your body. And I can't remember anything. It's all right. And then just come on back in the room. And when you're ready, let your eyes open, be back in the room. And that's very brief, but <laughs> did, anyone, uh, did anyone have a memory that was really special to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's, okay. And would anyone like to share uh, what, a little bit about the memory, it doesn't have to be details, not the, the, more the context rather than the content, but you ran, ran the memory and then how did you feel? Yes. Joyful. Joyful, yeah. Joyful. Joyful, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Blister. Blister. Blister, <laughs> yes. Fabulous. Yes, Michael. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Total connected to the whole world. Beautiful, yeah. Total connection to the whole world. Fabulous, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awe. Oh. Awe, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I don't know about you guys, but right now, all the hairs in the back of my neck are standing up. And, yeah, and uh, lifting the resonance. So this is just like, this is like anyone can do that. And you can just say, well, I don't know, I can just keep remembering that one where me and my, my sons or my wife and I or whatever um, change, instant changing of the resonance. And this resonant principle is felt in the body, and that's what Thomas Berry, incendence, <clears throat> here, be here now. 
The power of imagination. It's our greatest gift. The imagination is our greatest gift. The higher mind. Higher mind communicates with the everyday surface mind through the imagination. And higher mind, all of these different names, facets of the great ultimate reality, whatever it may be, source intelligence, ecological unconsciousness. The yogis, it's Ishwara Paramatma, Ishwara Supreme Controller Paramatma, Supreme Self. The beloved of the Sufis, the higher self of the Gnostics, the guardian of the shamanic practitioners, the godhead of the mystics, the goddess of the, um, I don't know, heart intelligence, collective unconscious, the Jungians, deep mind of mother nature, perhaps the Wiccans, the goddess, who talks about the goddess? <laughs> and what do you call yourself? <laughs> I was talking about the group. Okay, so the higher mind communicates with the everyday surface mind through the imagination. And just kind of think about that. You don't have to believe it. The heart acts as the portal between the surface mind and the higher mind, and the key to that whole thing is just heart focus. Lot Kelly talks about unhooking from, if, I, if you guys are primed, but if I didn't say this already, and I said, everyone uh, point to where you have your consciousness centralized, many people will go here. Yeah, not this group. <laughs> yeah. Um, but by having an awareness and a focus of this area of the heart, um, not computer, not giant brain, not the cognitive faculties, but the doorway into the great mystery. Another very brief exercise, heart centering. Right? Place your hand over your heart. Breathe into the area of the heart a little deeper and a little slower than usual. Just gently breathing, a little deeper, a little slower than usual. And imagining it's going right into the heart center as you do that. Smile. It doesn't have to be a big toothy smile, but just a smile, let a smile come onto your face. And breathe smiling into your heart. And then if you can, allow yourself to breathe gratitude, appreciation or any of those emotional states you felt just by running those memories just moments ago. And see how nice that is. That is so simple. 20 seconds, you're there. And open your eyes, take your hand away. Make a grimace. <laughs> it's, it's like, hmm? Hmm. It's such a simple um, uh, strategy. And from frustration, this type of thing, simple as it is. This uh, second one is, uh, that's from a heart math, almost verbatim, their language. From frustration, and it's measurable. I brought this thing, something I use, which is uh, it's called M-Wave Pro. Anyway, you just plug in a computer, USB. Plug it in, there's a software, um, and uh, you can just see as you're, you can go, how you can come into coherence. So the, the brain, the heart, the enteric nervous system, digest, everything goes in, and then the waves start to become coherent. And um, yeah, and I've got a very interesting little thing we're gonna do. As it, as well. Imagination more important than knowledge, Einstein. Some of you are probably familiar with that quote. I'm sitting in that little, under that tree there. Neil Gaiman, who's a British author. We all, I'm gonna read this one too, it's just so, so good. Adults and children have an obligation to daydream. We have an obligation to imagine. It's easy to pretend that nobody can change anything. That we're in a world in which society is huge and individual is less than nothing. An atom in a wall, a grain of rice in a field of rice. But the truth is, individuals change their world over and over. Individuals make the future and they do it by imagining things can be different. Right? 
And one of us in this room might imagine something one day from, the, from behind their hearts that something could come out and it could just sweep across the planet as if a phrase, an idea, a perspective, a vision. Rob Hopkins, Transition Towns. You guys have heard of Transition Towns, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. This book came out in 2019, From What Is to What If, mm -hmm. right? And then subtitle, Unleashing the Powers of the Imagination to Create the Futures <clears throat> We Want. Right? And um, it just came to him, this whole idea of writing this book like that. Well, how can uh, the power of imagine be unleashed and directed? How can we do that? How can we do it? And this is, <laughs> this is how I've done it for over 30 years with clients, uh, which is using what's called, well, I guess that's the next one, called the implied directive or general accessing formula, uh, made explicit by these two, uh, Milton Erickson and Ernest Rossi. Erickson was probably the most ingenious and innovative psychotherapist ever. And um, they had what was called idiodynamic responding, motor, idio, idiomotor responding, idiosensory responding, idioaffective responding, and idiocognitive. But basically, it's, this is kind of the idea that I, I have used in this sort of work. Start with this super powerful word, if, if a two, if is a two-lettered linguistic crowbar that can pry up the felt imagination. Can pry up the felt imagination. So we'll get into a few examples of that as we go. I choose to believe that there are three categories of identity that we are called to be. Right? Three categories. I'm Australian. Imaginarians. I don't really know where that word came from. Uh, possibly I made it up. I don't, I don't even remember. It's not important. But it's, what are you? I'm an Imaginarian. Right? There's different ways we can talk about ourselves, you know. Possibilians. <laughs> and uh, that was David Eagleman, who's a neuroscientist, and he was on uh, public radio, coast to coast in the U.S., after he came out with this book, which is just a kind of, I saw it in a... What is that? Uh, Rosetta Stone bookstore here in, uh, I don't know, a year ago I was there. I didn't buy it there, I got it somewhere else. But anyway, the point is 40, how does he call it? Uh, 40 thing, uh, there's 40 little snippets about what happens after you die from the most, how to say, c conventional theistic idea that there's a heaven or a paradise to, uh, Nothing happens because your body disintegrates. All the atoms and molecules just kind of come apart, and that's the end of that. End of story. So, but the, all there's so many clever and very creative ones in here. And uh, the radio interviewer, he said, "Well, Dr. Eagleman, you've got this theistic thing, and this sort of, I guess you'd call it atheistic or nihilistic or materialistic reductionism thing going on. What are you?" Are you, are you like an atheist? Are you a theist? And he, he paused and he remembered something a friend of his had said uh, only a couple weeks before. He said, I, I'm a possibilian. I believe in possibilities. I believe in possibilities. So, imaginarian, possibilian, and visionary. Being situated in the heart, asking if X were so, how would it look or how would it feel? How would it be? How would it sound? How, how would it even taste and smell? This is vision, this is the visioning this, and all the sensory channels. Right? Imaginarians, possibilians, visionaries. Okay? And Native Americans, any of you have heard how Native Americans are get involved in vision questing, right? And um, so in the 1920s, Carl Jung, with a few others, were invited to the United States. And uh, he ended up out in the, with the Taos Pueblo Indians tribal group. 
and the chief of the tribal group was a fellow named Achawai Baino, which means mountain lake. And interestingly enough, here's Carl Jung sitting by a mountain lake in Zurich at his self-made retreat called Bollingen. And so he's very familiar with mountain lakes. Anyway, these two had a conversation. And Carl Jung said, well, what, do you, what are your views of the Western uh, white people? What are your, how do you view them? Does anyone know this story that I'm about to tell? It's a great story. And he said, well, we kind of think you're crazy. <laughs> and he said, okay. So why? He says, well, look, look at most of you, not you guys. But not, not you, <laughs> but others out there. No, no, no division here. Yeah, no division here. No. He said, so many of the whites, their foreheads are deeply furrowed. Their eyes are bulging. Their lips are tightly pursed. Take, get, quiet, take, 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 take. He said, uh, and Jung's going, uh-huh, yeah. And, and he said, but that's not the main reason we think you're crazy. The main reason we think you're crazy is because you say you think from here. Mm -hmm. Taken aback, Jung said, where do you think from? And it was like, duh. He said, we think from here. Yeah. We think from here. Mm -hmm. right? So both of these men were vision questers. Jung's primary therapeutic approach was called active imagination. So he's a big believer in the imagination. Okay, so we, this section is almost over. I choose to believe that. I choose to believe that each one of us is called. Our hearing of that call can be clarified and amplified by consciously listening from our hearts. Each one of us matters. Our mattering can be intensified and grounded by consciously envisioning and feeling from our hearts. Luminous, life-affirming, love-infused futures. Luminous, life-affirming, love-infused futures. Yes? Why does it have to be in the future? Why can't love be here now? It can be. It is. But in so many ways, it's not. It okay. can be for each one. Of course. Of course. Yeah. But I'm talking about a gigantic, a gigantic architectural immensity. Something so big. Right? That I... I had, I had a vision of this thing in 1997. You know where the Echo Showgrounds is in Brisbane? Mm -hmm. I was headed to the giant hospitals there and I was headed north back up to the sunny coast and kaboom. And it came to me like as an explosion, as if it were an explosion mm -hmm. of this gigantic, immense, loving reality. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm going to familiarize yourself. You guys can read along with this. This is what we're going to do. This is another Biva. It will be hands to the heart, eyes closed, smiling, breathing into your heart, feeling gratitude. But then here's the process question from that language pattern. If you chose to believe that you could be meaningfully engaged in helping to birth a new earth of love, compassion, and the affirmation of life, what would that be like and how would it feel? Right? So there's a process that goes with this when you do it, and then we bring it right into the present. And how's that feel right now? Right? So go ahead if you would, and I'll, I'll guide you. I'll, you won't have to read this, but I wanted to familiarize you with that. Hands to your heart, eyes gently closed, a little smile, sending that smile down into your heart. Yeah, I got hair standing, breathing, Gently, lovingly into your heart, feeling gratitude perhaps. And just let this question sink and allow yourself to marinate in this question. If you chose to believe that you could be meaningfully engaged in helping to birth a new earth of love, compassion, and the affirmation of life, how would that be like? What would that be like and, and how would it feel? If you chose to believe that you could be meaningfully engaged in helping to birth a new earth of love, compassion, and the affirmation of life, what would that be like? And how would that feel? Feel into your bodies. Energy in the room is spiking. Notice that perhaps. 
How does it feel right now? Go into your body. Be with that. The incendence coming in further, deeper. Beautiful. Stay with that for a moment. If you chose to believe that you could be meaningfully engaged in helping to birth a new earth, birthing a new earth, a new earth of love, compassion, and the affirmation of life, what would that be like? And how would it feel? It's really happening. How would that feel? And how does that feel? Ah, oh, when you're ready. At your pace, allow yourself to come back into the room. Eyes gently open. Back in the room, anyone? If you'd like to just be back. And if anyone would like to share what happened for them with that little <coughs> exercise. Yes. I feel like I've already chosen that. Mm. Yes. And that's yeah. why I'm here and why yeah. I spend my time I'm not surprised that you're saying that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. I, I would imagine many of us have chosen that already. Yes. I, I feel like holding that vision is for every interaction I have. Yeah. Here, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it feels so beautiful and so expansive and so. Yeah. So grateful. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Yeah. And for me, I come into quite a sense of softening. Mm -hmm. My whole, um, yes, I can get into the opposite very easily, like I've gone forged forth, but yeah. this is where I just am relaxing into here. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. No effort. No. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Sword buckling. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> just relaxing into it, which beautiful. is beautiful. Yes. Feels yes. Sometimes people have trouble with this one because they're carrying a lot of sadness or hurt in their hearts, and so um, that can be a challenge for some people. I don't feel anything. Uh huh. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of that thing. It just pops in all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was that? Yes. Yeah. There we go. Um, I forgot to add this on while you were in that place. This is uh, from the beautiful book, The Illuminated Rumi by Coleman Barks and Michael Green. Feel yourself being quietly drawn. So I just have said, and can you feel yourself, and can you feel yourself being quietly drawn by the deeper pool of what you truly love? Right? That's a beautiful question. Uh, that's a beautiful book, The Illuminated Rumi. Part two. And as I said, we'll just go through, we'll get through whatever we can. And uh, whenever you buy a watch, make sure you can see the dial. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's why I got this. Bring the alarm clock. <laughs> okay. All right. So we go to four thirty, right? So I'll, I'll make a few calculations, yes, you can. Yeah, and I'll strip. I'll, I'll I will speed forward for a few seconds. All right. Janet Blake, JJ, Janet Blake. Uh, she. I gave a. I did a presentation, and she. Uh, after this presentation, she gave me this book. Hey. And she. Uh, it's on Centerby, and it was, this is the book. And I said, Sindri, Spirit of Love, this looks kind of airy-fairy. And when I saw, I saw it, I thought, it doesn't look serious enough or something. But it's actually just the most wonderful, it's a little book, maybe 100 pages. Uh, Ulysses de Corpo, PhD, and uh, Antonella Vanini, both Italian scientists, Syntropy. So most of us have heard of entropy from our high school physics, you know, everything's going to wear down, eventually we're going to go into heat, death, and the universe, everything is just going to flatten out into nothing, right? Syntropy is the, it's the yin and the yang, it's the, the counter of that other component. It was included in the E equals MC squared 
equation, but there was a more complete equation of that. And Werner Heisenberg, who was a Nobel laureate and a great physicist, when they said, wait a minute, that's not possible. We can use something, you can't have something come out of the future. Syntropy is about stuff coming out of the future. It doesn't even exist yet. Well, wait a minute. Time and space are modes by which we think, not conditions in which we live. That was Einstein. So, entropy. This is the one that we're most familiar with, especially as we're aging. I have all kinds of things going on in my body now. It's just breaking down. Can't stop it. You can, you can uh, how to say, uh, you can slow it down. Disorder-producing influences that propagate from the past into the present, right? What's, what direction is the of time go? It goes from past, it was yesterday, to from now it's today, and then it's going to be tomorrow. You know, it's those linear time. Give it enough time, the pyramids will be reduced to dust. Not a million years, maybe. How about a hundred million years? How about two billion years? Three billion. They're gonna, it's going to be gone. Human body, we're all more familiar with that. I'm very familiar with it. Like, it's wood lit it up, and it's burning, the combustion and everything is dispersing, and suddenly you're just left with a bunch of ashes. So that's entropy, that's the basic idea. This is kind of how it looks in a sense of causality, conventional impact causation. It's of the past, it's governed by causes, and that's called entropy. Do it from here into the effect, the present effect. Entropy is the very basis of our histories, narratives, and stories. So, when fairy tales are told to children, how do they end? Huh? That's right. And they lived happily ever after. But wait a minute. That doesn't belong to this. That does not belong to this. That belongs to this. Centropy. Order producing influences and information propagating from the future into the present. And we're going to show you an incredible example of this in just a minute. Experience, experience as a pull, for, a pull from the future. Pull from the future an attractor, an outcome, an attractor that consists of higher order unity and love. Okay? Now, this, we're just kind of skimming through this stuff as fast as we can. And um, there's, but I would say, look it up and start studying. There's now a thing called syntropic agriculture, which has some of the basic principles that they've incorporated in this. So here it is from the other side, retroactive uh, resonant causation. Resonant, remember Ravi Shankar, this resonant, retroactive from the future, it's vibrating back in time to the, to the present. So it's so the future, it's governed by attractors called syntropy from the future effect in the present. This, these are crude diagrams. Uh, Luigi Frantate, Italian mathematician, he worked with Einstein and Princeton and all the other boys and girls there called it retrocausality, but he coined the expression syntropy. Brilliant man. And we're going to watch a little example. This is about three, three and a half minutes. This is from Heart Math Institute. And it's uh, Roland McCready. I studied under Roland McCready some years ago but in the United States uh, to become a heart math trainer. And, uh, but he's just a great guy. And these are some of the categories, future, intuition, knowing, life support, life affirmation, heart. Okay, so just have a look at this. experiment here at HeartMath to study how the information flows between the heart and the brain. And we actually discovered something quite remarkable, something that surprised us. The participants in the study were connected to various sensors to measure their brain waves, their heartbeats, and so on. And then they were exposed to various images. Some were high arousal, uh, like a car crash or a snake striking, while others were low arousal images, like bunny rabbits and nature scenes. The participants were asked to push a button. They then saw a blank computer screen for six seconds. The computer then randomly selected one of these photographs that it displayed for three seconds. 
after that, the screen went blank for 10 seconds. And they were prompted to push the button again, and they repeated this uh, protocol about 30 times. When we analyzed all the data, the results were astounding. The heart seemed to know the images before the participants ever saw the images with their eyes. If the future picture was going to be one of the emotionally arousing ones, the heart rate started to drop about five seconds before the image was randomly selected to be shown on the screen. So nobody could know what this future picture was going to be. The heart had a much greater deacceleration than if it was a it was going to be a calm picture. These results have since been replicated in many different independent labs around the world, actually. Well, a lot of people say that I don't feel it in my heart, I feel it in my gut, but here's what's really happening. The information comes to the heart first, the heart then sends a different signal to the brain, which we can measure, then you have a brain response, and then a body response. And with a body response, like the feeling in the gut or the hair on the back of the neck, is where it becomes conscious. But the real flow of information is heart, brain, body, and this is all happening many seconds before the actual event occurs. So what this body of research is telling us is that the heart seems to be connected to a type of intuition that is not bound by the limits of time and space. But what is that source of intuition? What is the heart connected to? And how can we learn to tap into more of that? Mm -hmm. Now, this has just, just come out within the last six weeks. Um, some of you might be familiar with Terre de Chardin, who's in the far right, and he's the guy who said, we're not human beings having spiritual experiences, we're spiritual beings having human experiences. I think it kind of goes both ways, but that's what he's famous for, and as well as the Omega Point, and many things. He wrote this incredible guy. He was a Jesuit paleontologist, which is a little bit like being a, a vegan slaughterhouse worker. He's like, brilliant man, and uh, Jean Houston, who we saw earlier, when she was uh, 13, she was jogging with her little dog and she went around a corner in um, Manhattan, wherever she was, and run, right in, ran right into him and knocked him on the ground and winded him, <laughs> perished. And, and she's, as I said, she's, she was a big girl. And um, yes, so Donald Hoffman, neuroscientist, one of my favorite scientists, because he's a really honest guy. He's not attached, he's got, my story's gotta be the right story. And um, uh, Chetan Prakash, who is a mathematician who works closely, they work closely together. And just recently, they, they have come up with, it goes very deep and I could never really explain it, but they said, what it appears to be is that life is guided by final aims that are uh, convergent in the future. <laughs> and that Terre de Chardin was, seems to be right. What he said, it, it has been confirmed now by uh, a, a lot of really detailed scientific information. So he called it the omega point. Retroactive causation, something in the future is causing something to happen in the present. Mm -hmm. right, so that's just, so Donald Hoffman, uh, he's, uh, he wrote a book called The Case Against Reality. Reality, right? He said this, what we experience is like the desktop on the computer. Like, it's like little icons and I got my arrow cursors going around and all. That's. What's the, the deeper reality is all these electrical components. I have no idea what they are. So check out Donald Hoffman on YouTube and all over the place. Uh, Chetan Prakash, he doesn't talk as much. Uh, and then Terre de Chardin, he passed away in 1955. He said, Lord, <laughs> if, any, if what I'm saying has any truth to it, um, uh, sort of like send me a sign, let me, die on, let me die on Easter or whatever. And he died on Easter. So anyway, what it's worth. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Terence McKenna, but he was one of my heroes of the imagination. Uh, he died in the year 2000. I cried when he died because I just got so much from him uh, because he opened up my imagination a lot further. We're living in the shadow of the transcendental object at the end of history. So the same basic kind of idea. There's something out there and it's amazing. It's it's stupendous, it's immense, and it's 
it's drawing us in, it's drawing us in. And I, I have uh, various metaphysical, metaphysical resources that have said, no matter how, we're in the arc of destruction right now. We're in the arc of destruction, but it's not the end. The, what's coming is so beautiful. It's not the end, it's not the end, it's not the end kind of reinforcement. Yeah, so sadly, he passed away in 2020, uh, 2000 rather, it was 2000. The singularity, probably many of us have heard about this. Uh, it's more of a technological way of talking or thinking about things. Ray Kurzweil. Because AI, artificial intelligence, is coming in like fast. Mm -hmm. So, no, we don't, there's no way of knowing what is anything's going to happen. We, that's like, what's going to happen? Has anyone been on Chat GPT? Has anyone done that? Chris, have you done that? It's really remarkable. Have you done that? I, I've done it. Helen, Helena, rather. No. Yeah. Chat GPT, you just go on, and you can just type in a question. You can, it'll write a book for you. You can, you, it's just amazing. All my daughters use that. Yeah. Yeah. Work. yeah, yeah. The question is, is it her work? You know. It's fascinating. It is. Because you have to set intentions, and yeah. it gives you possibilities. It's incredible, and it's got the entire mm -hmm. sort of the worldwide web, all of the information at its disposal. That's a huge topic. I'm going to artificial intelligence. It's anyway, but here's the overview: future, past, causes, impact, causation, entropy, operating through attractors, governed through attractors, entropy, meaning in the present, very yin, yin and yang. Um, this is kind of encapsulates the whole deal right there. Right? <laughs> Life always seeks to diminish ent entropy and to enhance entropy. And to paraphrase Bob Dylan at the bottom there, be busy being born or be busy dying. Right? And examples, I remember being in India in, in the early 80s, and I think it was in the early 80s, and uh, there was a 747 flying out of Bombay, now Mumbai, flying out. And uh, in India at that time, people were so like, I want to get to the West. I want to get to, I want to be like America. I want American. So to get on a flight, to get the papers, the visas, and whatever you needed to get, and to get on those flights, because they were back, backlogged, huge. And for every flight, there'd be like 200 people in the waiting. Like, if anyone drops off, you know, you're in the queue for, right. This one flight, 70 people. I'm not doing this. And they got off. 70 people were in the queue, they piled on, right? And it was a big deal to not do that flight. It's what I've been waiting for for the last 10 years. I've been scheming and playing, how can I get to America or wherever? 15 minutes out of the Bombay airport, at just about cruising altitude, the plane blew up and everyone died. Oh, right? So. That happens so often. Yeah. So they knew when yeah. planes, flights are going to drop out yeah. of the sky. People, people just don't get on. Yeah. yeah. So they get off. <laughs> World Trade Center, 9-11. Numerous people got sick or inexplicably changed their plans before going to work in the yeah. building that day, yeah. right? Oh, I just feel terrible. Another Air India. Those are Indian, there's Air India and Indian Airlines. The Indian Airlines pilots are just, they're just cowboys. Man. They just, they do radical things. This is Air India. Between Dubai and Mangalore in 2010, plane crash killing 158 passengers. Only eight occupants survived the accident. After check-in, nine passengers felt ill and refused to board the plane. Think about that. It's a pretty big deal. I imagine just about everyone here has flown. Is everyone? Yeah. We're not going to get who hasn't flown. You haven't flown? But, um, <laughs> but it's a pretty big deal. If you've got booked a flight and you're ready to go and you've got your bags, they're, they're on, you stowed away in the plane and you're like, I'm not doing this. That's a pretty big deal. Train accidents. This is a five-year study. This is uh, William, William Cox, who was a U.S. researcher. Five-year study, 1950 to 55. Makes you wonder, trains are pretty damn dangerous. 28 accidents in those five years that he had studied, all coinciding with diminished ticket sales. And they, he went through all the variables, including weather, including all kinds of things, holidays, everything. And he it still said, it's really statistically significant 
something about when the accidents were about to occur. And Roland McCready, what he was saying about the uh, heart and the intuition of the heart, what, that's what, just what they're calling it, the intuition of the heart. Nobody knew, none of the researchers, anybody knew what the random image was going to be selected by the computer, right? It, the computer was randomly selecting images, and right up until the image was selected, it wasn't selected. And yet, every single time, this has been done in numerous laboratories, every single time that the, uh, how to say, the one that challenged life, it was, boom, heart rate would drop. That's just interesting. So the magnetic pull of tomorrow, entropy, persistent push of yesterday, entropy, and how are you oriented in time? I want to live in the now, but almost nobody does, even those who, I read all of Eckhart Tolle, are still not living in the now. Um, it's hard to be because we are trained to live in the analytical mind, linear time, and even it's like right now. Now, I know, actually it's yeah, very difficult. Uh, it's a whole other approach in that regard. We're not going to read all these, but any of you are welcome to take pictures of them later uh, as, after we end, which is coming up quick. So what I think I'm going to skip to do, yeah, is this, uh, why, are we, why am I bringing this stuff up about entropy and syntropy? Because our conventional entropic orientations limit us to what we believe is possible. I can't be a possibility because I just I don't have the I don't have the evidence enough. We often need evidence in order to begin believing in our own intrinsic power to change things by our visioning. Right? Willingness to believe in the possibility. With the willingness. I could be a little bit willing, I think. Right? Belief in the possible, and then it's possible. It is possible. To probable actual and I I'm gonna stop here this is about being architects of the future Buckminster Fuller we are called to be architects of the future not as victims but I'm gonna jump ahead to the nine um, keys uh, so I'm just gonna there's so much good to stop here man this is killing me <laughs> Okay, nine vision seed templates. This is a way, how do I, how do I encapsulate what's going on or the, how do I establish myself or contextualize myself in the reality that's happening right now? So, Buckminster Fuller, geodesic dome, he's one of the great genius, innovative, creative people in the 20th century. Does anyone know where that's from? Call me Ishmael. Song. Oh, come across it. Chris, yes, wow. call me Ishmael. Gold star. <laughs> <laughs> call me Ishmael. Well, I'm pretty sure about Mr. Fuller for his uh, epitaph uh, was working off of that because that's one of the most famous beginnings in American literature. Call me Trim Tab. Now, when I heard that, I, uh, the first time I heard it, I thought, is that some sort of like dietary pill or something? <laughs> <laughs> But this is it. I'm going to read this. This is good. Something hit me very hard once, thinking about what one little human could do. <laughs> Think of the Queen Mary cruise liner. The whole ship goes by, and then comes the rudder, and there's a tiny thing on the edge of the rudder called a trim tab. It's a miniature rudder. Just moving that little trim tab builds a low pressure that pulls the rudder around, and the rudder pulls the ship around. It takes almost no effort at all call me trim tab it struck him so like we can have we can matter in a big way even though we're well, you know from outer space you can't see us uh, you know from just low orbit so we're each becoming this is a vision seed template we're each becoming a trim tab helping to steer the ship of humanity further into the visionary pull of luminous futures what do you think about there's a birthing process going on all right you midwives uh <laughs> And, you know, I read uh, David Cheek and Ernest Rossi wrote a book called um, Mind Body Therapy. And in there, David Cheek, who is a mature uh, obstetrician and gynecologist, you know, like for 60 years, he's like one of the big guys in America with it. 
He said, you know, women have, giving birth, it's not always pain. There are often orgasmic, there's an orgasmic thing that occurs for some women. This doesn't have to always be, ah. Anyway. <laughs> Humanity's growing up. Mm -hmm. He's a teenager, he's got his mobile phone texting, he's turning around, driving the car, and <laughs> talking to someone at the same time. And Woodstock, I could have gone. Uh, I was in New York City on that summer, and they had the posters all over, you know, the, the guitar, what is it called, the bridge or whatever, and the little white dove at the end, and we were in a combi, Volkswagen combi, surfboards on the roof, and we were headed out to Long Island, Montauk Point, for big surf, and um, you guys want to go to this thing? I don't know. What do you guys, what do you think? Uh, it'll probably be pretty crowded, you know? And, and, and yeah, glad we didn't go. Peace, love, and garbage. This is the nature of adolescent. This is not the grown up. This is not being responsible. Uh, and yeah, so humanity's growing up. We're, when we do surveys and ask, where do you think humanity in general is at? Um, the majority of people say, oh, kind of like the, You've been at the adolescent stage, kind of self-centered and kind of like just out to have a good time or whatever, something like that. We are the pollinators, the planet is fruiting. There are different categories of sort of identity or behavior that we could be involved in. What's the fruiting of the planet? New consciousness, new awareness, love, the new world. The old world of butter is becoming the new world of ghee. <laughs> and back to that quote by Jung. Has anyone here made ghee from butter? Yeah. Yeah. So you know yeah, <laughs> that in stage two, if you have it on a low heat overnight and you come in the morning, all the milk solids and so-called impurities have come up to the surface. We can see them. And you're like, right? That's what's happening right now. Right? Yeah. We, we're seeing <laughs> this is what's going on I just wanted to live in the village being happy <laughs> right okay. right. enlightenment is not attained by imagining beings of light but by making the darkness conscious that's, that's where we're at with this we are each like the last few grains of sugar in an ultra saturated sugar solution so you, have, you can have a sugar solution and it's so wow. radically saturated yeah. and it just crystallizes Right, we're we're right we're right there, we're right there. So hold the line, keep the faith. We're right there. A new and higher order is arising out of chaos. So in chemistry, there's a thing called dissipative structures and chemical clocks. And you just you got you got a Bunsen burner or something. You got some chemical solution there. So it's like uh, crank it up, uh, just and. Um, Suddenly, order arises out of this crazy, chaotic circumstance. So when you make a cake. Yeah. <laughs> Not my cakes. <laughs> no. no. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Great. I'm going to use that. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> okay. Number eight. We are the white blood cells within a planetary immune response. Right? One way of thinking of it. Right? White blood cells are doing their thing. And one of my favorites, we are the imaginal cell taking part in the transmutation of humanity and planet Earth. Caterpillar, what do they do? Uh, consume, 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 that's what they're doing. Oh my God, what happened to the tree? It's all the leaves are stripped off. But after the consumption stage, they go into the chrysalis or the pupa, cocoon, whatever. And there are these actual cells that are called, by the biologist, I didn't make this up. Bruce Lipton. Imaginal cells, yeah, he didn't make it up either. <laughs> but yeah, true, imaginal cells, and um, they take the nutritive biochemical soup and they convert it into the butterfly. And yeah, so there's a kind of a magic afoot, right? There's a magic afoot and we could be like the imaginal cells, it could be that. It's interesting, imaginal. Hey, we've been talking about imagination. Yep, so that's that. <coughs> I'm not gonna do this conclusion. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna go back here, because we're done. Yeah, we're about done. But I just wanna show you this. 
this is something that I can send you. I can send you a PDF of this. Raising the resonance of humanity and planet Earth through heart transmutation artistry. And basically, it's counterintuitive. We are sitting in meditation. I like you to breathe in love and breathe out peace. You know, now this is breathe in. This is like Jesus getting crucified stuff. This is, I want you to breathe in the pain, the loss, the sadness, the hurt, the, you know, breathe, take that in. I was going to do it as a group, and I was going to have us get into a circle, but such is life. Um, so, you get heart-centered, you're breathing in from your enemy, you know, not that you guys have enemies, but you're breathing in from people who are out there that are maybe causing harm or whatever. I'm going to breathe in all of their hate, all of their sadness, all of their hurt, all of their... I'm going to breathe that in. And then there's a hush more still than silence. It's there beyond, beyond seeing and hearing that all your dreams and visions are born into that hush in the quiet behind your heart. It's right there. It's not really... It's not there. It's, it's in that whole space of open awareness behind your heart. And, oh, wait a minute. When you've taken in a full breath, breathing in all these kind of things, hurt, anger, grief, sadness, loss, loneliness, blah, 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 silent pause, awake awareness behind the heart, transmutes the pain. So it's a digesting and a transmuting of the, all this painful stuff into higher frequencies. And then you gift those higher frequencies out into the world, breathe out from the sacred heart space behind your heart and into individuals in the world, any of these, love, peace, joy, empathy, with me, right? You're doing a good thing. You can be living a meaningful life. I don't know what to do that's meaningful. You can do this. And this meaningful kind of activity where you're literally dying for the sins of the world is a very elevating and lofty and beautiful and high resonant, high frequency thing to be doing. Throughout history, different people have called different facets of this different names, but it's all kind of connected. Compassion, bodhicitta, spiritual grace, forgiveness, self-sacrifice, open-hearted gifting, tonglen, taking on the sins of the world, karunaya, causes mercy, surrender, unconditional love, letting go and letting God, lok among them. So this could be a, this could be a really valuable meditation. It's not this, this is for I just want to get in a deep meditation for me, right? And the empirical evidence I've used this thing on numerous occasions. Just keep testing it out, and I go further and deeper into coherent states when I do that one than when I'm just like counting my breaths and right, just like to be in a meditative state for me. It's giving. It's a really good thing. So. Um, I'm happy to send that to, to you guys, and I've got cards or flyers over there, and you can take that, and you can have my contact stuff, and just happy to send it. But uh, the little chart of it, breathe in, the suffering of humanity and the pains of the world, we're breathing that into the heart center, and it goes to the back of the heart center, and it's a two-dimensional drawing, of course. Receive power and limitless support from awake awareness, digest and transmute whatever that stuff is. After it's transmuted states, you breathe that out through the heart and you're gifting human beings and the world high resonance states. That's a good thing to do. And then, yeah, and then just breaking it down more. Okay? So that, my friends, is the end of our presentation for today. Thank you very much. I guess, I guess that there was a question or two, but um, we're really kind of, this is our time. You can, you can have a question. Yeah. 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 Question or two, if there is any. We just sort of tidy yeah. up. Tidy up and, and just keep <laughs> rum, mumble about, rumble about. <laughs>